This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and today I'm speaking with Guy Itzaki and Guy Ziskind, who are respectively the CEO and founder of Phoenix. Phoenix is an Ethereum L2 that is focusing on enabling computation over encrypted data via fully homomorphic encryption. We're going to get into uh, what all this means in a second. But first of all, let me welcome my guest today. So welcome, Guy. And Guy. Thanks, Felix. Thanks for inviting me. Good to be back. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Guy Z, you've been on here already. You have a big background in crypto, uh, building like multiple of the like cutting edge projects in, in sort of the privacy space, at least from my perspective. Um, so maybe we can start there and, and kind of start with the usual epicenter question of, you know, how did you get into crypto and, uh, how did you end up at, at Phoenix now in the end? Yo, so, uh, good to, good to be here again. I think, I've, uh, we've had that conversation or at least I've, I've said that, uh, I've told that story a few times before. Um, I'm celebrating a decade in crypto, which is either an achievement or something to be ashamed of. I'm still not sure and I'm still deciding, but it's been a decade. Um, I got into crypto in around uh, 2014, actually even 2013. Um, really got caught up with the technology. Um, I was starting my master's at the same time and decided that I really wanted to focus on research and more uh, deep diving into what we can do with blockchains um, beyond just Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum was in like alpha stages back then. It was just starting out and that was very inspiring for me. And then I landed into the problem of uh, privacy um, and specifically uh, came out with this problem, which is today it's already like a well-established problem, but back then it was really novel. Um, how do you do private computation on the blockchain, how do you basically do confidential smart contracts? And uh, that was uh, what I focused on on my thesis uh, using uh, secure multi-party computation technologies at the time. Um, and that led to a project called Enigma, which eventually turned into a secret network. It had a few iterations um, and secret network is today like one of the largest uh, Cosmos uh, chains that specifically focuses on private compute, but it uses, for the most part, a uh, trusted execution environment, which is another technology, um, and, and a few others. Um, but then in the last couple of years, as I was going back into research mode, I kind of became convinced that SHE is the future. 
um, and basically decided to focus most of my time on that. And, uh, you know, that kind of turned into Phoenix in the last like six months or so. Right. Yeah. Awesome. We're going to get a lot into the different like sort of technologies that are out there and, and how FAG compares to them. Because I think that's like kind of key to understanding, you know, what, what Phoenix actually is and maybe also like clearing up some confusion for our listeners. Uh, but yeah, first guy, Itzaki, maybe you can give us a little bit of background how, how you met your your name, cousin, and <laughs> the started in crypto. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my background is a little bit different than the typical uh, crypto native folks. Uh, I've been at Intel for many years. Um, I think somewhere around 2017 is uh, where I started actually working on blockchain. I, I was leading Intel's trusted execution environment ecosystem development and did several projects with Intel SGX. Uh, one of them was actually to build um, a private blockchain network for a financial institute. Um, a stock exchange. Um, it was a permission network for lending securities. And it got me quite excited about the technology. And um, actually, I was, you know, 2017, it was a, a very fun year to be involved in. And I got invited to tons of conferences um, to represent the enterprise point of view of blockchain. Uh, and in one of the panels, I met Guy Ziskin. Uh, we started chatting. And I think it was very clear after a few minutes that um, you know we have a lot in common, specifically about the, the desire and, and the need to introduce privacy into that space. Um, in 2017 and 2018, morphic encryption was just you know an idea, wasn't really mature, but SGX was, and you know I worked with Guy back then about the usage of TEs uh, within uh, his project. But I kept on monitoring the progress around FHE and, and was quite excited about that. Um, in 2020, I, I decided to uh, take a leave out of that space and, and did a gig uh, working on the Olympic Games. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of sports. And when the Olympic calls, you, you cannot say no. Intel was a sponsor of the Olympic Games. I got the opportunity to work on the Tokyo Games and the Beijing Games. Um, Non-blockchain related, but just very cool technological innovation in that space. Um, we can do a podcast about that, you know, for like a couple of hours as well at some point. And then, you know, 2022, um, the, the, the itch came back and um, I transitioned to lead the FHE um, business activities at Intel. Intel is building a hardware accelerator for homomorphic encryption. It's, it's public. It's part of a DARPA initiative. And uh, throughout that, I basically scanned the entire market. So figure out the usage within cloud service providers, federal entities, financial institutes. Um, and I have to say that the, the progress around FHE has been quite uh, um, quite impressive. We'll get into that later on about some of the key challenges, including performance and complexity and, and how they're being sold. And I also met Zama, which we'll chat about them as well. And in earlier this year, I was in Israel visiting at Guy Ziskin, and he told me that he's noticing the same progression with FEG. And that was really the sign for me to to, to leave Intel and, and join Phoenix. Right. Awesome. That's amazing that we, ha we have both of you here, like the experts on this topic. I think, yeah, we saw a lot. Probably most people are very familiar with ZK and like sort of the progress in the ZK space and in, in its connection to crypto and, and sort of the Cambrian explosion of um like research in in that area but i guess fhe is sort of seems more undercover still and and maybe you will be able to shed some light into into how how it can be applied to crypto or, or why why this may be a game changer but yeah maybe first of all we can start off with i guess like just the concepts of like mental model of these different technologies how how do they compare and and how um, yeah, do they work and how is FHE like sort of the, like maybe end state of it is if that is even like correct to say that's sort of like how I guess I look at it. Um, could you like, yeah, kind of compare maybe for me, like one of you guys, um, you know, what, what secure multi-party computation tries to achieve and maybe how, yeah, maybe let's start there and then we can get into like how keys achieve it and how FHE does it. First of all, I mean, I think at some point people in crypto will have to kind of get used to the idea that it's not either or, 
all of these technologies will play a part in like DNB. Um, I do agree with the assessment that FHE is probably like the end game solution in the sense that it will do like most of the heavy lifting and most of the important work when it comes to like encryption and private compute or secure computation, whatever way we, we decide to define it. But you will still need ZK regardless, even not just for scaling, but 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 uh, uh, for some other things, uh, you would still actually probably want like TEs or some form of like hardware security models, which are like a lightweight version of TEs closer to uh, how the wallets uh, are in, in how they work. So all of these technologies will have a part to play, uh, NPC as well. Um, but just to give like a very, very quick overview, let's, let's start with the problem, not with the solution. So the problem that we're actually trying to solve in blockchain is essentially what's known as secure computation. And secure computation has two branches. One of them is you want the computations to be correct and trusted. That is something that blockchains already do, right? Like you write a smart contract on Ethereum. By definition, the reason you use Ethereum is because it's a trusted platform. You know that it, that code is law and you're going to get a correct result. So that branch is solved and has been solved for about a decade. Then there's the other branch when it defines secure computation, and that is confidentiality or privacy. Again, different people use different terms. And that is the idea that like you have a multi-user system, right? Like maybe I have my data, you have your data, Guy Tsaki has his data. We want to run some program, some logic on top of all of our data. But for that logic either to be, to have, either we just don't want to share like our private data with each other for privacy reasons or for the logic to actually make sense, we aren't able to share it. Like think about a, a game of poker, for example, right? In a game of poker, each one of us has our own deck of cards. If everyone sees each other's deck of cards, I mean, it's not about caring about your privacy. That's just a poker game, right? Like you can't actually do that functionality without privacy baked in. So that is really the idea of secure computation. You, you have multiple users sharing data. They want to be able to share their data privately, such that other participants and even the, the computers running the program itself can see the data. And also they want to know that the results are correct. That is a problem, right? Like the problem is how they get both correctness, which blockchain solves, and how they get privacy. And for privacy, then you have those different technologies, right? That people are getting used to at this point. So I'm actually going to leave ZK and FHE to the, to the end. So I'm going to talk about two techniques that are maybe easier to grasp. Uh, one of them is trusted execution environments. Um, these are fairly easy to understand, right? There's like a magic black box inside of your processor, inside of your computer. And basically the assumption is that no one can break it and that no one can probe into what's going on there. So, and so basically, if you want to do a computation privately, then all you have to do is you have to encrypt your data from the outside with some key that exists only in that black box. And then you send like your code and encrypted data to the black box that uh, um, uh, T, the, the, the data is actually being decrypted inside, the computation is done uh, inside, and only the output maybe gets revealed. Uh, to you or to someone. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, using the hardware, you use hardware to simulate the effect of computing over private data, but there's obviously a big assumption here that no one can break that black box. I have two things to say about that. Like, as people have seen, that black box has been broken before, and even with secret, that has been an issue, and even with other systems. On the other hand, I do think people overestimate the problem with this. Like, these are and evolving technology and many of those actual problems are going to be solved over time. But it's, you know, it's, it's always going to be a simulated solution. It's not a purely cryptographic solution and it's always going to have its problems. The, the upside is that it's very fast and very, and very cheap in comparison in co compared to like deep cryptographic solutions. Um, the other solution is to use something called NPC. MPC, um, I'm not going to get, that's actually probably the hardest one to explain in a way, because what happens with MPC is that the data is being 
split. It's it's kind of like a blockchain. The data is being split uh, across like several validators or nodes in the system, and then they run. A, they take like a program, a regular program, and they basically transform it into this multi-party computation, this equivalent secure program that they can run together as as an interactive protocol where they make sure that they never reveal data to each other. Every one of them always have like an encrypted piece of the data. It's called a share of the data. But they can somehow together magically compute any program and, and any smart contract and obtain the output without actually bringing the data together um, um, with each other and decrypting it. Uh, so that's kind of like how MPC works. And then FHG is probably the most sophisticated technique, but it's actually easier to understand. It actually is most similar to, to T's. Um, really, all that happens with FHG is that everyone encrypts their data they send it to a server or to a, you know, or to a network of servers, but let's just say it's a single server for now. And that server just computes over that encrypted data without actually knowing what the data it computes over. And then it gets an, an encrypted output and, you know, maybe that out, output gets decrypted or maybe it's sent to some user, but the, the whole computation happens directly over encrypted data. Uh, and that's really the magic. Now, all of those Technologies, they very, very directly solve the problem of secure computation. They allow multiple users to somehow encrypt their data, and then they allow one or multiple servers to compute the functionality or the smart contract or whatever over the data. And now we get to ZK. ZK actually works very differently. In ZK, you can't actually do secure computation. Um, what you can't actually be, you can't actually combine data from multiple users and then compute over that data privately and then produce a result. You can do single user private computation. So if I have data, if I have like private data, maybe it's like my age or my date of birth, and I want to prove to you that I, I'm over 21. So I can compute, uh, you know, just like a comparison comparing my date of birth with age 21 and then produce to you an output that says, look, I'm over 21 and also here is a proof that I didn't cheat on that computation. But if it, you think about the poker example again, there's no way to do that with ZK alone. But it's, it's actually not, not something you can do. The, the closest you can do with ZK, if you want to go back to that same multi-user model, is you need to have a trusted party. You need to have someone that everyone trusts, right? Like uh, maybe it's you, Felix, right? Well, like maybe all of us trust you more than you trust us or that we trust each other. And so we send you our data. You run the computation in the clean, see everyone's data. And then you can send a proof to everyone that, you know, you ran whatever computation correctly, but at the end of the day, someone had to see the data and in that case, that's you. So that's like the best you can do with ZK now. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's been a lot to unpack there. I think, I guess you also mentioned that these technologies can partially work together or will work together in, in a sense. Is that also like, could you, the computation from FHE somehow create a proof and like, because I guess from what I understand in FHE, you still need to like reproduce the computation to prove its correctness, I guess. Is that, could you combine like FHE and ZK somehow to kind of prove and, and make it multi-user like that, or or is that not a not a thing? So, okay, so actually, the current FHE, so FHE, you know, there's, there's one thing I gloss over. FHE, there's an encryption key, um, but who has the decryption key? That is like the the, the big question. You can't. I mean, there's a there's a technique called multi-key FHE where you can theoretically combine multiple keys, but it's like not practical and has other problems. So really. You need to have like one key or multiple keys, but like all the users need to, to, for example, encrypt their deck of cards with the same key. So again, who has the decryption key? And if someone has a decryption key, then that's like a, that's like a, you know, like a, a trusted point. 
Uh, so what you do is you use MPC. So remember, with MPC, you can split the data. So you take the, the decryption key and you split that across the network, the entire network. Uh, and then that network does something called the threshold decryption. Whenever you need to decrypt the data, the network can come together without actually recombining the key. Like they never, the, the key never lives in one place, but together they can decrypt, uh, you know, an output for a, a, a result. So you actually need MPC to turn FHE multi-user. And then for what you describe, yes, you also, I mean, if you want to do verifiable SMG, if you want to do like a ZK FHE rollup, right? So which works just like a, a regular ZK rollup, but everything is encrypted, then you would have to go over the FHE computations and, and produce a ZK proof on top of that saying, hey, I ran the FHE computation correctly. That is a very active research area, but it's nowhere near practical. Just putting it out there. I think we're like, you know, maybe five years plus away from that. But that's going to be the end game. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's like the recurring theme. It, it seems a little bit, bit that like a lot of these technologies are sort of developing, like you also said, for TEEs, right? Like currently, like there's still some problems, but um, as there's more research going in and as they're being used more in practice, they are developing. And, and I think a lot of that was like when I initially read about FAG, I think, for example, News Cipher, I think was pretty early, like looking at this in 2018, 19, but then it seemed like very impractical or there wasn't like anything um, there. So maybe can you, or maybe, yeah, one of you uh, go into how FAG actually evolved and, and how it now became practical to do this or, yeah, or is there even like still yeah, more improvements to be made, more optimization so that it's even getting even better? Like, can you maybe like kind of walk us through the, the history of FHE in, in that sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I think when, when I mentioned, you know, 2017, 2018, um, FHE, um, you've started to hear about it. But it, when, when we say that it wasn't mature then, I think the challenge that you typically have with FHE it's twofold. One, it's considered as very complex for developers to build on top of that. And the second one is performance. And I think even today when we talk about FHE, there is this notion of FHE is still very, very complex and very, very slow. But like everything in life, there has been progression and this has been constant progression throughout the years. And what we see today is actually that these problems are starting to be resolved. So let's maybe start with the developer's complexity. Because the data is encrypted, you can't really operate the way you operate on a regular uh, program, right? There is no if and else because you don't actually see the data itself. So you need to have the, 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 the application being built in, in a specific way. Uh, to, for having developers do that, there is a very limited set of people with that skill set. So what's been built in the last couple of years is actually a set of compilers that abstracts a lot of the complication from the developers. That's where I think Zama really shines. And, and you know, Zama is a partner that we're working with. And uh, with the introduction of the FHEVM, in, in that case, basically developers can just write smart contracts without any need to understand FHE whatsoever. They basically... Uh, define or solidity base, so developers don't actually even need to understand, you know, any different new language, and they just decide, you know, which asset they want to encrypt on the blockchain, and and they encrypt that part. So I think in terms of complexity, that problem specifically for the blockchain is, I can say, probably kind of resolved. Um, the second part is is computation. Now here. Uh, we talk about FHE as if it's, you know, one monolithic entity, but actually within the FHE world itself, there are different schemes. Uh, some schemes, or you can look at them as like variant, are better for some applications and others are better for others. So you have schemes like CKKS and BGV, which are probably better when you're doing machine learning and artificial intelligence type of, of, of computation. In our case, the scheme that uh, we are using is, is TFHE, and uh, this one um, has something called programmable bootstrapping, which means that, that the noise is being cleared every operation that's being done. Not, not so much important for that case, 
But um, I think that the improvement that's been happening is also on the scheme level. So the schemes are becoming more efficient, thus making the computation better. So that's part A of the, of the solution. And the second part is clearly hardware. And uh, as we get better hardware, better CPUs, better GPUs, and, and the next couple of years also ASICs coming into play, we definitely see the path for uh, resolution towards that. Um, FHE, unlike uh, MPC, uh, is is computation bound, and you can say that MPC is more of a communication bound. But with FHE, it's, it's more computation bound. So the more hardware you throw on FHE, the better performance you get. And uh, we're actually um, seeing significant progress that's happened in the last couple of years. And you know, I I came from Intel, so I know the hardware space pretty well. And we can definitely see that in the next 12 to 18 months, there are, I say, over a dozen companies that are building dedicated hardware accelerator for FHE, which really gives us the signal that um, performance is, is going to be resolved in the next couple of years. Awesome. Yeah, maybe I guess let's take that to the Phoenix, like sort of blockchain level in a sense. Like you already mentioned, you need this MPC uh, to have the decryption key for FHE. So I assume there are some roles in the network of, of, of Phoenix, like I guess validators or maybe like like different roles are. Yeah, maybe you can explain. Are, is this going to be like one role that the people have to run these hardware accelerated FHE hardware uh, and also do this MPC? Or are you splitting these these things up? Like how... How is sort of the network architecture of, of Phoenix going to look like, if that's already clear? Or like, yeah, I guess, how are you thinking about it? I'd say it's pretty clear at this point. Uh, we put like the main building blocks that we've been building in 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 our L2 white paper, if people want to read and go into a bit more detail. But generally speaking, like we kind of landed the, the right architecture with an L2, a wall-up architecture. Um, for for the for the, the same obvious reason that the wall ups make sense in general. Like there is no reason to replicate the computation across like all validators in the network. It is enough to have like one node or a small number of nodes, like like do the actual computation, um and sequencing and all that and then let others just validate. Um and with FHE that makes even more sense, right? Because FHE Kind of like ZK requires like very heavy duty cryptography that's very very expensive. Those are, you know, those those are all hard servers. If you need to lay consensus on top of that and start to sync validators, that's gonna that's gonna take too long. So anything that that relates to execution is better done individually or in small groups. Anything uh, done with with validating, you know, anyone can do it with a longer time window. Uh, we're taking the optimistic call up uh, approach because, like I said, ZK, ZK, wall up, ZK FHE wallups are not are not going to be practical for quite a while. Um, so you have the same role that you have in a wallup, but then you have another additional role, which is the threshold network. The threshold network will have the shared decryption key. It's going to be run by validators, and whenever the user requests like a decryption or re-encryption operation then that network, which is going to start small, um, but ideally, eventually, it's going to become like very, very large. Like that's like our long-term goal. Um, uh, that level is going to actually handle those. And actually, we're coming up and thinking of like other like stuff that accelerates like FHE that that network can actually do. Like the... It, I think at, at, the, at the end of the day, like most of the computations will be done uh, via FHE, but you would be able to maybe speed up some specific bottlenecks of FHE like with MPC on that network that actually goes beyond just uh, like binary decryption. But that's like further down the road. Okay, cool. Thanks. And, and I guess, yeah, maybe also getting back on the first point, like sort of the developer experience point is it fair to say like you know f fhg evm and sort of zk evm has been sort of like is that a similar like framing like that that like these compilers do a similar job there or like how how do you think about it and is it only 
I guess you guys are focused on EVM with FAGVM, but is there also other like VMs that could could be supported with FAG or is, is are you also working on that or you know how how do we have to think about that? Yeah, I think both of us both of us came from a very practical standpoint here. And you know, when we started thinking about about Phoenix, it was clear to us that we want to make FAG as simple as possible to onboard developers. So so we had a couple of of, of decisions. The first one was that we want to target the Ethereum community uh, and Solidity based. We don't want developers to actually need to learn a new cryptographic. Uh, they don't have to be cryptographic at all to, to use it. And we don't want them to learn a new programming language. So um, the decision to go with uh, an EVM like FHEVM like solution was was the first one that, that was made. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize that um, FHE enables you to do computation on data while it's encrypted. I know Guy, Guy Z talked about that earlier. Uh, while ZK enables you to verify uh, uh, data. So I don't think there, I mean, there are not so much similarities in what we're offering in comparison to the ZK EVM. I think that the usage of the FHE EVM is, is, is quite simple. It, there is an additional library that developers can utilize when they want to encrypt data on the blockchain. And once they encrypt this data using a function for decryption, uh, that data is encrypted on chain and it enables to do computation on this data while it is encrypted on the blockchain. And that is, I would say, quite easy from a developer standpoint, whether it is to write a new uh, contract or potentially to import existing smart contracts into Phoenix, the, the transition itself is not very complex. I think where the complexity starts to come is actually it's a, it's a, it's a mindset that, that needs to happen because now you need to actually think about designing your solution with confidentiality in mind. So it's not about, okay, let's just encrypt this data and, and leave it there. You know, how do I prevent others from figuring out this data through other means. So if you extract some assets from a pool, it's not enough that this asset is encrypted. You actually need to make sure that the pool itself is encrypted because otherwise people can subtract and, and figure out how much uh, you, you've pulled. So I think there are a lot more of a design related questions, but in terms of the actual building blocks, it's, it's, it's fairly easy. And, and that's really where things become interesting. So I, my thinking about this has evolved in the last two months. In the beginning, I said that I view FHEVM and ZKVM as very similar, but the, I think the more, the more we dig into it, the more I've realized they're basically incompatible. So ZKVM is really about writing the EVM interpreter in a way that's amenable to proving that, you know, some EVM execution ran correctly. If you're a developer, you don't, if like you're a developer that's running on, on a ZK EVM, you just write a plain regular Solidity contract. You don't actually use a, a ZK, but whoever needs to design the ZK EVM circuit, that is a very, very, very hard task to do. Um, what is with as as guy uh, and guys is saying like with FHE like we are trying to externalize um, essentially library or a tool for like Solidity developers and and to your question there's no reason it needs just be for Solidity like you we can support everything but like we we focus on Ethereum because that's the biggest ecosystem and we're the biggest team um, so it's in in some ways it's closer to like you know libraries like safe math from like open zeppelin and like those like initial libraries where you could actually just write like faster more secure code for your smart contract to think about it to use those libraries and solidities to write private computation code but in a very very simple way like it's as easy as using something like safe math so it's it's really not compatible it's more compatible to maybe like, you know, uh, I think uh, Aztecs, like, like uh, Noir language or other DSL domain specific languages that 
that that other companies that are building uh, ZK, trying to build ZK uh, private smart contracts solutions are doing. But here is actually where FHE really shines. I mean, first of all, FHE can do stuff that ZK private compute can because ZK, as we said, is not meant for private compute. But more importantly, because ZK is not meant for private compute, then now you have to learn a new language. You have to start thinking what computations need to happen with the client side, what computations need to happen you know, on the smart contract, basically the backend side. Whereas with FHEVM, like with Phoenix, it's just write your smart contract and store everything. Here's a library to do like FHE computations and bam, that's all you need. You don't need to 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 to, to know or understand anything else. Um, with the exception of what Guy said, which is not a technical component, it's a philosophical component. Like you need to think about you have encrypted data if at some point you want to decrypt information or reveal information, well maybe that leaks more than the new identity. So you 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 need to think about that. So yeah, it's 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 very very different in my opinion. Okay, okay. So maybe maybe to summarize how how I understood this now, I guess zkVM, you're essentially as a developer just building like a normal application still, right? You you're not doing any private computation with zkVM essentially, right? So right, that's one. Then domain specific language, right? You can do like a zk and write in another language, which obviously has the downsides of that, and then sort of. Phoenix or FHEVM allows you to write the same language plus like these new use cases. So, so I guess is that correct? Like on the high level, like as a summary, sort of. Yes. Yes. Hundred percent. Cool. Awesome. And and so then, yeah, I guess what what becomes interesting. You already mentioned like sort of the poker example. Um, you know what what sort of like other use cases are you interested in, or like what what what. Should people get inspiration from for for this or what is already being built? Like anything, really. I'm curious to hear what your what's happening on on Phoenix already, or what you want to see actually. Yeah, maybe I'll just start by saying that before we talk about the specific use case, um, you know, I, I'm I'm more of an outsider, you know, in in this space, you know, coming from the corporate world, and and I have to say that you know when I look at the blockchain from the outside. It seems to me that you know the fact that there is basically zero confidentiality. I know some people see it as as a feature, but for me, it's a significant limitation. I, I just feel that we're you know if we we want we're all here because we we believe in in blockchain and we want to see it being massively adopted. But I feel like we're in this ten or twenty percent, and we have this seventy percent of a gap that that still needs to be resolved. And a key component of it is data confidentiality. I just don't see how blockchain can ever become like mainstream and, and very, very successful without any data confidentiality. For sure, there is like no chance that any corporates or financial institutes or government entities will use public blockchain without data confidentiality. Uh, and that is actually why we uh, we believe that this is not you know, FHE versus ZK versus TE, but rather, you know, we're all here for the same goal of introducing and making the blockchain better. Um, we have a couple of, of, of use cases that, that we typically talk about, but I think the belief is that data confidentiality needs to be a, an underlying capability. And, and once you make it easy to use, it will become very, very common similarly to the way that you operate today in the traditional world where you know everything out there is uh, assumed to be protected it may not be but you know it's assumed to be protected so just putting it out there um the, the goal here is not so much to introduce confidentiality for the you know it's important to protect users confidentiality but what we actually believe is that by enabling this new capability it unlocks new applications that you couldn't do before. And the game of on-chain on -chain poker is, is, is a good one because, yeah, people are like figuring out some kind of solutions for on-chain gaming, but they're not really ideal. And once we introduce FHG or whatever type of solutions that are out there, you can start using it the right way. Um, so on-chain gaming is one, um, I would say uh, voting is another really clear example of how do you do 
voting or DAO voting uh, without encryption. It's, it's, it's quite complex. Now we can actually uh, do that with FHE. Um, sealed bid auctions. Guy, I'll let you, you know, talk about a few of the use cases as well. Yes, I mean, but just to drive your first point home, like, look, I mean, we're far, we're not there yet, and we're quite far out. But at the end of the day, if like people are dreaming about the convergence of like AI and crypto, well, how are you gonna have like something like a distributed chat GPT if everyone can see? Like, if I can see your prompts and you can see my prompts, and we can actually have like models with like private data, like, like that's not gonna happen. So like. We have to solve that core problem, and then we can start thinking about like these really, really cool like uh, AI slash crypto revolution and many things like that. Um, but you know, if you want to be more grounded to what the technology can do today and what people are looking for today, then yes, on chain gaming, voting are a couple. But I think you know we can't ignore the fact that there is still a lot of interest and and not a, a, around DeFi and and most ecosystems. Most like ec- like infrastructure and protocols ecosystem have started by bringing a large inflow of users that come for the initial DeFi application. And so the question is, what are the interesting DeFi related applications that can be done on things that cannot be done anywhere else, at least not as efficiently? So one of them relates to obviously MEV. So you know, you 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 mentioned that it have been a really be like you know, behind the scene talks and obviously it's the talk of the day and Justin Drake talks a lot about it. Like FHE has really a lot of potential to like introduce solutions and the proposal builder separation and block building like uh, uh, flow in different places of the pipeline. Probably the lowest ending fruit is around the the seal bid auction. So uh, auctions don't have to be done like on an ev- on on every block. So then, like you know, FHE is efficiency is less of an issue. Like you can you can run an auction and choose like a sequencer for for an epoch for like you know a, a specified number of blocks, and that can run efficiently enough. And you can do that much more efficiently with FHE than with the other technology. And without FHE, then obviously you don't you don't get sealed with auctions, which are far far superior than public auctions. Like that is. A well-known game theory fact. So that is like real money on the table, like very plainly, right? Like that is a use case that uh, shared sequencers and decentralized sequencers and, 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 and pretty much all of the ecosystems are looking into right now. And that is something that's very concrete that Phoenix can solve pretty much out of the box and immediately. So that's something that we're looking into. And there's a lot of variations about that. Another use case that I'm actually very, very interested in it's a two building blocks use case but the but the underlying use case is actually doing something like like thor chain like like thor uh, swap and their lending um there's a lot of demand for doing cross chain DeFi in a decentralized manner like we've seen that with thor chain but imagine that you can do it with solidity and then have all of the building blocks that people have done today, like all of the DeFi applications that people have built on the Ethereum ecosystem, imagine you can take them, copy paste them, and use them on an ecosystem like Phoenix, but the underlying assets um, are not just ERC20s, and they're not just rock Bitcoin, but they're actually native Bitcoin, and native Solana, and all that, completely cross-chain, more like how ThorChain does that, and the way you can do that is because with Phoenix, like a very simple use case is you can create these micro bridges. We call them micro bridges because like you can actually have a vault inside of a contract. You can have like a private key of a Bitcoin vault encrypted inside of a smart contract and then people can like deposit and withdraw um, like native Bitcoin and use that um, in a decentralized fashion inside of like Uniswap and, and other DeFi applications. So that is something that we really, really want to focus on because, or hopefully encourage other de- early developers to focus on because we think there's a huge market there. Right. Yeah, that, that seems super interesting. I guess it's like TorChain is, is using some like threshold signature scheme where the validators share this key in, in 
Can you explain how, how this is different again, maybe? Yes, so in Phoenix, like instead of having like a, a threshold key, what you will do, you will take like a, just a key or generate an, a key, but it's in, you generate it with in FHE, so then the key is always encrypted. And you just store it in a contract state. Like you have a Bitcoin private key, you don't have to split it. You just take it as it is encrypted. You put it on a, on a, on a Solidity smart contract in the state. And you literally have an operation, say, like sign. And in the contract, you do an encrypted sign. And then you only decrypt the signature. You never decrypt the key. So the key is always encrypted. And now you have a smart contract that is actually can act as a, you know, as, as, as a wallet. Um, the reason NPC assumption is, uh, uh, again, as well, in the sense that the ultimate FHE decryption key is split across the network. Um, and so if you ever are able to reconstruct that key, then you can decrypt the, the private key in the contract. Uh, so it's not as much as it is about the better security model, although we can argue specifics why it is more secure, but uh, uh, that's too, too many details. I think the point is programmability. Like in Toche, like the team had to spend a lot of time like, building an MPC protocol to split the key and then build, you know, a Uniswap kind of like a variant uh, on top of it that uses it and then like build a lending protocol and each one of those takes t to kill. But with Phoenix, once you have that building block where you can keep an encrypted key inside of a contract, like a Bitcoin encrypted key, and people can send uh, to that address the money deposit, and then that contract can sign transactions, um, a, can basically sign uh, Bitcoin transactions, then that's all you need um, from a, a, from, like, like that's all the different logic that you really need. Then someone else can come in and and just take like Uniswap, fork it, maybe it's Uniswap themselves, fork it, and then combine like take those like 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 those contracts that I told you those like micro bridges contracts and put them as assets into their Uniswap clone, into their uh, other clone, into whatever. So the programmability of using now cross chain assets becomes like completely easy and solved. And all the DeFi developers don't actually have to deal with it once that building block is still, as opposed to something on top chain. Right, right, right. Yeah, super, super interesting. And and these, so these micro bridges, someone would have to build like some something there, like some sort of how how do I have to imagine it? I guess because in this MPC world, you have to build like some sort of light, have to have the light client and and the nodes, the MPC nodes have to run it. Is, is this similar here or you just need like some sort of code more or less? So we need to take care of the threshold network. That's like a big piece in, of, of the thing protocol. That's always going to be there. But beyond that, FHE is much simpler than, than it's not simple. Like the, the, the math is harder actually than MPC, but, but running it. And, and by the way, that's one of the reasons I became bullish. I, I'm an MPC person. Like most of my research is on MPC, but like I'm more bullish about FHE because FHE simplifies from an engineering perspective and a developer perspective a lot of the stuff that MPC doesn't. So from a developer perspective, like once we have like once you have FHE VM like the library and you have a threshold network and we're building those, right? It's like some of it uses like Zama's underlying libraries, but like we're building like everything on the sides and on top and, and, and improving that and all that. And once you have those then all a developer has to do is literally take a Solidity contract that will have an API to generate a key, an encrypted key in the contract, right? Like, the, in, in like through the library, they will be able to sign transactions within the contract, um, uh, within the Solidity contract from the library uh, without ever, ever decrypting the underlying private key, and they won't have to worry about pretty much anything else. So... I'm not sure if that answers the question, but it's like really, once you have the building blocks, it's all then simplified. Yeah, and, and I would say this is really the goal, which is to build a very strong set of capabilities that then enables developers to take and build the likes of TorChain and, and other solutions 
without having the need to spend a year or a year and a half to build your own protocol uh, with, with a lot of cryptographic complexities because it's all pretty much baked in the underlying Phoenix infrastructure. Makes sense. Thanks, thanks so much for expanding there. I think um, we we talked a lot about, I think one question that, that I wanted to address and we also talked behind the scenes already before a little bit about it, but I guess, you know, privacy and blockchain we have like this sort of uh, relationship where on the one hand you you want it obviously like so institutions can use it um but then you have this other side essentially where like having private transactions and private um things can also mean that you know not even the government or someone can look into it and and maybe you have like compliance issues right so like one big example there was like tornado cash and sort of how how that impacted the ethereum like landscape uh through for example also flashbots but but in many in many ways um yeah i guess the way i understand it you can build like these applications on on fhg so so i was wondering you know how what's your approach to like sort of compliance and confidentiality is there any any thoughts you guys have or, or how are you building uh towards i guess making it possible for also governments to be uh, involved in, in this sort of technology? Yeah, th that question came a lot, you know, in, in our early days. And, you know, people, you know, they heard about Tornado Cash. Um, and in Tornado Cash, what happened was that the, the, the identity of the users was actually masked, uh, which is different than what we are offering with Phoenix. At Phoenix, uh, it is the content of the transaction that is encrypted, but actually, we're not masking the identity of the the, the users who are doing the transaction, uh, and this is a significant uh, difference. Um, so, if if the government has an issue, they would be able to identify who the person is, uh, similar to to other blockchains. That's that's no different. But the content of the transaction itself is encrypted. Now, there is definitely interest. We've heard it from multiple entities about applications uh, such as, you know, dark pools, etc. And we believe that they can be resolved in a compliant manner. So have an identity, which is a centralized identity encrypted on chain that goes through a compliance process and then being used in a comparison with, uh, with a pool. Um, so that's really, a, it, it's a significant difference. There is no plan here to offer capabilities similar to like, Tornado Cash uh, on top of Phoenix. I'm going to give a slightly different version, if I may. This is not the, the use case that we're focused on. And this is not something that we're focused on out of the box. But like you you can, even as it currently stands, you can use FHE to build anonymity as well. Like there, there are ways to do it. And if PayPal and developers want to do it, they can do it. Even if we're not going to be the ones focusing on But it is possible to build it on top of Phoenix if people choose. Uh, and the other angle is that I do think that like even if people choose to build anonymity using FHE, um, which is more akin to Tornado Cash, but it works differently, but still uh, gives similar results. The benefit compared to Tornado Cash is that FHE, like NPC, like trusted execution environments, they are completely programmable. So if we go back to this idea that ZK has a lot of limitations at the end of the day when you're trying to do like like private computations, especially in a multi-user environment. FHE doesn't suffer from that drawback. So you could technically, like developers can come in and program in like a, a completely privacy-preserving USDC variant that also has like uh, selective disclosures like on an aggregate level, like maybe... Set like maybe like a, there's like a fraud and an encrypted fraud detection algorithm running inside a smart contract that only if there's like a really, really suspicious alert with a more than 90% probability, then it sends that to some authorized uh, third party. So like you can actually do all of those things with Phoenix. I don't know that we will be focusing around it and definitely I think, but I am kind of curious what's going to happen when developers come in and actually try to do things, because I think then the crypto ecosystem would have to face a very difficult question. Like, 
are, like, are we willing as a as an ecosystem to have a system like that, or does that completely go against the crypto ethos? I don't think I want to be the one to answer that. I hope other people will be will put themselves in the position to to answer that. But it's absolutely technically possible to do with FHE. Right. I think yeah, it makes perfect sense. I, I do think that question is being like sort of shifted around because I guess in the end, no one really wants to deal with that or can even maybe because it's like pretty hard to be in touch with all governments and like sort of focus on that because in the end you're, you're trying to build technology. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground um, running close, close an hour. I, I wanted to like kind of end it by talking a bit about the sort of roadmap of, of Phoenix and, you know, where, where you guys are at in terms of the, the launch of, of the L2 or, um, you know, test that. Yeah, please let let me know. Like we're recording this year in January eight, so yeah, what's the plan for the next few months? Yeah, so um, we have our DevNet already uh, up and running. The last it's a limited access DevNet. It's been up and running in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, Testnet is coming in Q one, um, and then goal for mainnet is uh, early twenty twenty five. Um, I will say that, you know, people are definitely encouraged to come and sign for the testnet once it's available. Um, we're going to be in East Denver. Uh, looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, we're doing an encryption day uh, during during that period. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting event. So we have a great line of speakers from, uh, all over. And it's going to focus not just about FHE, so MPC, ZK, uh, Trusted Execution Environment. So again, encouraging people to to join to that. But testnet Q1 and then uh, goal for mainnet is uh, early 2025. Awesome. Sounds sounds like a realistic timeline, maybe for, for a change. It's not like super close. So so I wish you the best to to like be able to to hit those milestones. And yeah, um yeah, definitely if you guys go into Denver that are listening, try to check out the encryption day. Um I think yeah, that's that's it from my end. Thanks so much, Guy and Guy, for coming on really um insightful episode i hope people picked up something on fag and um we'll we'll link to the yeah website and then some other material in the show notes thank you very much thanks a lot felix